Welcome to Spirit of Truth Church for this sermon on Matthew 13, verses 54 through 58. And now let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, we praise your name. We thank you for all that you have done. We praise you, God, for your sovereignty. We praise you, Lord, for your salvation. Lord, we thank you and we know, God, that you are working all things to the benefit of those who believe. We praise you, Jesus. Thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. Lord, to you be all the glory. In your name we pray, amen. And now, let's move to the reading of the scripture. Matthew 13, 54 through 58. He went to his hometown and began to teach them in their synagogue, so that they were astonished and said, How did this wisdom and these miracles come to him? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother called Mary and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And his sisters? Aren't they all with us? So where does he get all of these things? And they were offended by him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his household. And he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. Now, I'd like to argue the main idea of these verses is as follows. These verses demonstrate the hardness of the hearts of the Israelites in Jesus' own hometown through their resistance to Jesus' message in spite of his miracles and wisdom. And now for the exegetical part of the sermon. So verses 53 and 54 mark the fourth major section of Matthew's Gospel. Jesus finishes the delivery of the parables, demonstrating Israel's blindness, and then he goes to Nazareth, his hometown, to be rejected. In many ways, this is a shocking response from the people he had known since childhood. And so again, the overarching timeline is this. Jesus was raised in Nazareth, which is a questionable town. He returned there following the baptism and temptation, but he left for Capernaum after hearing of John's arrest. He returns home and announces his mission from the synagogue. Matthew then focuses more on the Galilean ministry. Luke focuses on the Nazareth ministry. Luke records that what Jesus taught in the synagogue astonished people. He had wisdom and miraculous powers that they recognized. But Luke records that they tried to kill him, whereas Matthew only says they took offense at him. So this is a serious offense. Let's say that. It's a serious offense. They are going to try to kill him for this. And there were two phases to Jesus' teaching. The first phase is the wisdom and the miraculous powers. And the second phase was God's work among the Gentiles and its association with the Messiah. And so he implied in this that Israel was no longer the sole focus of the Messiah. This is one of the main reasons why they were so upset at him. It wasn't the wisdom of the miracles. It was the Gentile mission and the global mission of his work and salvation. Now, in verses 55 through 56, we see that the attacks come, and they begin by trying to reduce Jesus to a mere human only. And so they reference what? His earthly traits. Though they were aware that the Messiah would come as a human to an earthly family, they tried to use this against him. So again, they were going against what they even knew from Scripture because they didn't like certain aspects of his mission and vision. And so they say, well, where did he get all these things? What things? The miracles and the wisdom. They were trying to challenge his source and authority, much like the Pharisees saying, you know, Satan sent you or you're a Beelzebub or, or you know, you're demonic in origin. They were also saying the same thing. They were also trying to say, well, no, you did this stuff by demonic work. Again, how do you do miracles and wisdom by demonic work? This is part of the problem. They are also committing the unforgivable sin. They're basically saying we reject the miracles, we reject the wisdom, we reject the words, we reject everything about him, and we're going to blame it all on demons. Now, Jesus was a common person with a message that included the Gentiles. He wasn't a Pharisee or a scribe that they were used to. He came as a carpenter's son. And in verses 57 and 58, we see that Luke tells us that the people in the synagogue were enraged. They wanted to kill him. And so Jesus' response is what? A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. And we see that there's a difficulty of separating a prophet from his past. We see that this is actually quite difficult when people know a person, have grown up with a person, and then the message 
is decidedly elevated from that common status. Now, we also see that Jesus did less miracles and ministry here due to the unbelief. And it's very important because there are many groups and interpreters who try to say that, well, this is because of the unbelief limited Jesus' ability, that he couldn't do that. But here's the thing. It's not that he couldn't. It's that he did not do many because of their unbelief. What is this actually getting at? Well, it's getting at the idea that the power to work miracles is based only on the will of the divine, not on the partnership between the man and the divine. The could not do is not related to ability, but to mission. It was not in his purview. God would not be honored with miracles done in light of such unbelief. So it's not in a ability, but it is due to unwillingness that Jesus would not do what the Father was not willing to do. And now for the exposition. So Jesus' message was very divisive. It's easy for us now to question why someone who would do miracles, heal people, command nature, resurrect and resuscitate people, and preach forgiveness of sins would be hated as much as Jesus was hated. And so let's look at the positive aspects, the easy to swallow aspects about his message. First, the king was returning to establish the kingdom. It's a positive thing. Forgiveness of sins is generally positive. It's going to be used against him as a blasphemy only after he's rejected. But in general, being forgiven of sins is a good thing. There were miracles. There were healings. There's freedom from demonic possession. And the gospel in general, to the general person, was a positive thing. Now, there were a number of negatives, though. The rejection of the Pharisees and the scribes' external righteousness laws. This included a rejection of their teaching and authority. That was tough for people to swallow. There's the inclusion of the Gentile population in salvation, mission, and plan of God. People did not like that. There was his common attire, his common history, and his demeanor, not as a king, per se, or as a scribe or a Pharisee, but as somebody who came from relatively basic surroundings, a carpenter's son. There was the lack of the conquest mentality and agenda. He wasn't coming to defeat the Roman Empire at this point. And then there's the negative part of the gospel which is that you have to recognize your own sin and need for salvation. And this is a stumbling block to many. So we can see why people would reject the message. We can see why they hated Jesus in spite of all of the good that he did. And so what does their attack look like? Well, this is what we call the normal attack on Jesus. And what's the contents? Trying to reduce him to a mere man. They mention his unimpressive history, his unimpressive lineage, though his actual lineage is descended from David, his unimpressive job as a carpenter, his very normal human brothers and sisters. They are most likely married and living in the area. And his very normal parents. And then they attack his source. So where did he get these things, the wisdom and miracles? It certainly wasn't from his job. It certainly wasn't from, you know, being an elite religious leader. It certainly wasn't from any of these things. From his parents? No, of course not. And again, this is similar to the judgment that Jesus was demon-possessed. And so what's his response? There's a unity and a separation between a person and the work God is doing through them. And in the case of Jesus, this unity is the morality, the holiness, the consistency, and the righteousness. But the disunity is in the history, in the backstory, and in the normalcy of his upbringing. Again, he is the king, but his backstory about being a carpenter's son doesn't really fit in with that. Just because he's a carpenter's son, though, doesn't mean he's not a king. His origin was in Nazareth. It seems very as backwater, backwater town. And it's harder for people who know the person to accept the truth of his message. And so this leads to the, re the reason for the lack of miracles. You know, charismatic interpreters state that this means Jesus couldn't do a miracle because people lacked faith. And so they'll say things like, oh, there's too many people who don't fully believe, or you didn't get a miracle because you didn't believe enough. That's a false interpretation. It was the will of the Father that Jesus not do miracles. They would not bring God glory due to the rampant unbelief of the people there. And so this had nothing to do with inability, but it was rather an incompatibility with his mission. Now, in terms of Christological setting, we see Jesus as the Messiah, the suffering servant. Here he's being rejected. He's the rejected king and prophet. His, his miracles and his wisdom is being is, is acknowledged as good, but it's being rejected in light of his actual mission. Now, what about application? Well, we need to check our own understanding of Jesus. The temptation is to view Jesus too personally or too commonly. People often say, oh, Jesus is a friend. Jesus is just like a person down the street. He was, he was common. He was the everyman. And this, these are true things. He is a friend. 
He he was common in the sense of his his upbringing, but he's also the Lord and King. He's also the resurrected Messiah. And so there are some issues with this quote relational Jesus. People make up false conversations or false attributions of statements. They believe that the things that they hear in their mind are directly from God. The problem with that is, is what if they're wrong? What if what you thought you heard, quote, from Jesus is wrong, is not theologically accurate? And so this is a serious problem because then this makes Jesus all about you rather than the mission of God. This attributes things falsely to Jesus that he didn't actually say. Yes, God speaks. He's spoken through Scripture. Yes, the Holy Spirit can teach, but he teaches in alignment with Scripture. And it's when people begin to claim that they have all of these extra-biblical revelations that we run into very serious issues, where their view of Jesus becomes heavily skewed. It becomes more based on their subjective hearing or thoughts than it does on Scripture. And so we have to safeguard against that. We cannot make Jesus out to be too common. We cannot buy into this relational version of Jesus, whereby we have hours-long conversations with Jesus in our private time that have nothing to do with Scripture, maybe make us feel good, but have absolutely nothing to do with the Word of God. This doesn't mean we can't meditate on the Word of God. This doesn't mean that the Spirit won't apply the Word of God to our lives. But this idea that there is a Jesus that is personal to us, that is separate from Scripture, is a very, very serious issue. Now, in terms of apologetics, the attempt to normalize Jesus in the modern day scholarship and liberal theology is very common. Um, in terms of evangelism, we see Jesus as the Lord and Savior. These are two most important aspects of who he is, and our relationship to him is based on this. Again, getting back to the relational Jesus, the problem is, is people say, we just need to ask Jesus into your heart, and then you'll know that he loves you. That's not the gospel. In fact, that's a false gospel that prevents people from being saved. This idea that you need to have a relationship with Jesus to be saved, and then it's like made into this mystical, personal ability to have conversations with Jesus in your mind, that is a false gospel. What should having a relationship with Jesus mean? This. That you relate to Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that he has personally bought you and redeemed you back through his death on the cross, and that as a result of that redemption, you are now in the family of God. There's your relationship. It does not guarantee a personal one-on-one -on -one conversation with Jesus whenever you want. Yes, we can approach him in prayer, not arguing against that, but I'm arguing against this mysticism that has come to dominate our understanding of Jesus. The relationship we have is not in our minds. It is secured by Christ at the cross. When we are secured by Christ at the cross, we are given eternal life. We are made brothers of Christ in terms of the adoption of the family of God. Our relationship is secure, but it's positional. Yes, there is a relational aspect to Christianity. There, there is the reality that we can um, talk in prayer to God, to Jesus. There's no question about that. There is the reality that we have the scriptures here. We have the Holy Spirit to comfort and guide us. But that's not what we mean when we say you have to have a relationship with Jesus to be saved. What we mean when we say you have a relationship with Jesus to be saved is that he is your savior. It is that he died for your sins and he has redeemed you. In that sense, the relationship is one-sided. Our relationship is based on what he's done for us, not in our ability to talk to him. He is our Lord. We owe him our obedience. We gain from him our instruction. He commands. He's our Savior. We have in him forgiveness. He shows us compassion and teaches us humility. We have him as an elder brother. He is the first fruits of the resurrection that we will have. And we have a relationship with him as one with a family member. However, that relationship is still only partial here on earth in terms of the relationality of it. In terms of we don't see him face to face at this point. And I'm not arguing that God can't speak. I'm not arguing that God can't tell us things. But what I am arguing against is rooting our relationship with him in that type of thinking. Our relationship with him is rooted in his death on the cross. We should be going to scripture, not a subjective experience, for his words. 
The word is how we can relate to Jesus. We relate to him through scripture because this is a living and active word. Jesus is still speaking through his word. It's not a dead and done word. It's a living and active word. So in conclusion, in attempting to understand Jesus in the Gospels, we must be vigilant not to compartmentalize our view of him or reduce him to purely a verbal relationship. Our understanding of Jesus leads to our presentation of the Gospel and our discipleship. And now I'd like to close in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the scriptures. God, may we reject a mysticism understanding or a mystical understanding of who you are. May we embrace the truth through scripture. Lord, we accept and appreciate your Holy Spirit here to guide us, to illuminate scripture. But God, may we derive our understanding from you not on anything other than the very word of God itself. Because that is the only source of divine revelation. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us here at Spirit of Truth Church. Hope you have a wonderful day.